Welcome classic rock fans to another ranking, worst to best so to speak, and today, rather foolishly, I'm going to tackle the Neil Young discography. Now, this is humongous, uh, as you can imagine, so I'm going to have to be fairly brief of each album. Also, I will exclude live albums and releases from his legacy series. So Neil Young, the studio albums, the good, the bad and the ugly. So let's start with the real munters, shall we? Number 43 is Landing on Water from 1986. There was a tendency in the 1980s for 60s, 70s legends to explore the sonic palette presented to them by the, the production tropes of the 1980s, not to mention all that electronic gadgetry and wizardry that was uh, on offer. So if it's good enough for uh, Paul Simon and Don Henley, why shouldn't Neil Young tamper with all this stuff? Well, the answer to that is uh, we might end up with an album like Landing on Water. And it's not all bad. Some of the writing is quite good. I think Hippie Dream, which is a devastating portrait of David Crosby, is worth listening to. Although it has to be said, this album is rather kneecapped by the sterile and unsympathetic production of its time. Number 42 is Are You Passionate from 2002. This album is rather disjointed. It's, it's almost as if it's not quite sure what it actually is. It's, um, it kind of identifies as a Neil Young album, but maybe a kind of R&B album, if you will. Booker T and the MGs, I think, rather clash with Crazy Horse on this one, even though they seem to provide the platform for Neil Young's musings. The nine-minute closing track, She's a Healer, seems to go on forever. Now, of course, Neil Young and Crazy Horse can certainly meander a bit, but if there's a, a kind of an emotion or, or, or feeling or purpose, intent behind where they're going, it kind of works but unfortunately this doesn't. It's forgettable mid-tempo stuff. I mean, the horse builds up a bit of a trot on going home, but it never really breaks a sweat, to be honest with you. Number 41 is Peace Train from 2016, an environmentally themed album. We get a lot of these from Neil, anchored to the uh, Monsanto years, of course, and Earth. However, the plugged-in acoustic songs feel more like eco-barbs than they do genuine uh, attempts at decent songwriting. This album has been described by one critic as uh, nearly 40 minutes of messy finger pointing. And as listeners, we certainly get tired of that uh, incessant wag of uh, uh, Neil Young's more didactic material. You know, this is um, you know, obviously partly inspired by the environmental protests at Standing Rock Reservation, uh, but the songwriting is sketchy at best half-baked musical ideas and platitudinous lyrics and, and just when you thought that there, there wasn't sufficient reason to thoroughly hate this record neil delivers by experimenting with auto-tune number 40 is everybody's rocking from 1983 this record can be commended as a uh, neil young extends his middle finger to the man the man being his uh, record label uh, they demanded a rock album from Young, and he took that um, rather literally and produces this rockabilly, rock and roll pastiche, you can call it that. Um, not lovingly created, but one that's just tossed off as a, a big fuck you to Geffen Records, I think it was the label he was with at the time. This album, of course, moves us in a totally different direction from the electronic splurge that was trans, the album that uh, really uh, provoked the ire of his label. And then we get this rockabilly parody. My word, no wonder they hated him. Number 39 is Storytone from 2014. This is Neil's second album of that year. And we get um, an album that is very much a far cry from the stripped back Letter to You. This incorporates orchestra, choir and big band. And we get some cuts, again, about the environment. In fact, I think this album should be called Yawnsville. But there are some love songs thrown in for those of us who are getting a little bit jaded with all this eco-warrior stuff. It's an unfocused album, so much to the extent that it was released in three different versions, they just couldn't make up their mind. One orchestrated, one stripped back, and one with a bit of both, which is very much emblematic of the indecision that plagued this record. Number 38 is Live from 1987, an album that seals Neil Young collaborating with Crazy Horse once more. It was an album that was recorded live but not live, if you know what I mean. It feels like the obligatory Crazy Horse outing, although nobody's heart is in it, or ears for that matter. Number 37 is Old Ways from 1985, and this is another example of Neil Young playing chicken with his record label. 
to the detriment of uh, those of us who actually go out and buy his albums. Anyway, this is a traditional country LP that lacks any charisma or spark. The tracks My Boy and Are There Any More Real Cowboys are okay, really, but uh, this album is what it is. It's just a bit of geffen baiting, overproduced, syrupy country cliches. Number 36 is Fork in the Road from 2009. There's a line on this album, I'm a big rock star, my sales have tanked, but I still got you, thanks. This kind of says it all on an album that is effectively dashed off. Dashed off is the best compound adjective to use to describe Neil Young's output these days, as he tends to churn out an album in less time than it takes us mere mortals to crimp off a turd. And on this album we get more about pollution and the financial crisis than we do actual music. Fork in the Road is a single themed and thoroughly dull album. We do get tracks like a Fuel Line and Hit the Road, but even these sound aimless. Young's later stuff by numbers. 35 is This Notes for You from 1988. Young shook off Geffen, returned to his old record company and took shots at the music industry with this album. Backed by the Young Drives, which is effectively a kind of an R&B combo. Or certainly an R&B influenced group, shall we say. This Notes for You piles one tuneless attack upon another. It's an evisceration of um, 80s rock penchant for uh, corporate sponsorship. But it does have some good numbers on this record, and those tend to be the tracks that are somewhat understated. Numbers like The Atmospheric Twilight and the rather plaintive Coup de Ville. Number 34 is the Americana album from 2012. Young and Crazy Horse convene here to butcher or rework, if you will. A lot of uh, traditional songs like Oh Susanna and Clementine. It sounds like a kind of a sprawling, uh, ill-disciplined musical piss-up. And it's such a shame because Americana has, uh, is an album that has the potential to be absolutely wonderful. But instead it sounds like a hastily assembled loose jam session. It's uh, sloppy throwaway stuff at best. Number 33 is Trans from 1982. Young's notorious electronic album. An electronic concept album from Neil Young is what we were all gagging for. And of course this heavily features the use of the vocoder on most of the tracks, which is what caused his relationship with Geffen Records to, shall we say, break down a tad. It's certainly an ambitious endeavour, we have to give him that, but it's a jarring album uh, at best, inspired by his uh, quadriplegic son. It's, it serves for me as a, a kind of an interesting curiosity rather than a, a, a palatable listen. Although it has to be said that the track Transformer Man sounded fantastic when Neil Young did it with an acoustic guitar on his Unplugged album. Number 32 is the Monsanto Years from 2015, working with his new band The Promise of the Real, which actually featured the Sons of Willie Nelson. This is a heavily political album when Neil Young takes aim at the giant GMO giant Monsanto. This album feels like an extended 50 minute rant that tires very early on. One critic has described it as a 50 minute PSA. Effectively it's loose and impulsive. Uh, it, it does have some nice moments that I rather enjoy but they're few and far between. It has this single-minded agenda which a lot of Neil Young's later stuff does and, and that tends to get rather fraying after a while shall we say. It does feel like a collection of ranting uh, blog posts and it does music. Number 31 is Broken Arrow from 1996. There is a theory that the death of David Briggs, who was uh, Neil Young's long-term producer, seriously uh, derailed many of Neil Young's creative efforts because uh, uh, David Briggs tended to rein him in, even sort of calling out the less inspired ideas for being just that. I, I certainly feel that sometimes Neil Young seems to lack a creative control filter and he just churns stuff out really, even sometimes two albums a year. And there seems to be a, a, a motif here or pattern that after David Briggs' death that a lot of the material seems sprawling and directionless. Broken Arrow is loose, freeform stuff really. It's muscular at times, but uh, generally an album that I could live without. Number 30 is Chrome Dreams 2 from 2007. Back in 77, of course, he recorded the first album, which never saw the light of day. It was kind of reconfigured as uh, uh, American Stars and Bars. But this sequel, um, if you've heard the original album, this sequel is nowhere near as good as the original record, which is actually seeing an official release soon. And it, it tends to be made up of a handful of songs that Neil Young just had knocking about, giving this album a somewhat uh, patchy feel to it. 
Number 29 is Hawks and Doves from 1980. This is a wildly uneven album. It's a follow-up to its wonderful Rust Never Sleeps record. It's a ragged collection of thrown-together country tunes and sundry offcuts. I mean, granted, Young was uh, experiencing some family difficulties at the time. Nevertheless, the title track of this is just absolutely dreadful. There are some good songs on here, though. I think the uh, Captain Kennedy and Lost in Space are just absolutely brilliant. Number 28 is A Visitor from 2017. Uh, this is Young's third collaboration with The Promise of the Real, which tend to sound like a tethered uh, crazy horse, to be honest with you. Tethered outside a glue factory, no doubt. Mostly the album is about living under Trump's presidency, which, uh, as you can imagine, uh, Neil Young has problems with. It's basically Neil Young just sort of coasting here, creating music and lyrics that are just commenting on daily news headlines, backed by a musical template that swings from a circus waltz to the Broadway stage. Not a brilliant album, but nevertheless, I found this one quite interesting. Number 27 is Mirable from 1995. I love the looseness of the sound in this album, the intensity. Uh, Neil Young really playing up to his uh, monocle, the godfather of grunge here, I think. This album came about after um, Neil Young and Pearl Jam bonded, I think, at a Bob Dylan tribute concert. A few years later, of course, they've bashed out this LP, and bashed out is the, the appropriate verb here. Although I must say, Pearl Jam come across as a more polished version of Crazy Horse. This is considered part of Young's comeback albums, which I think started with Freedom, and perhaps ends with this one. Number 26 is Greendale from 2003. This is hailed by some as a real return to form. I don't buy into all that nonsense when these new albums come out, to be honest with you. Basically, in terms of Neil Young, it translates as a slight improvement on its lacklustre predecessor, which was ironically titled, Are You Passionate? This is Young's 80-minute rock opera about a small-town family, and it's specifically the way politics and environmental issues affect their lives. The title in no way belies the rather bluesy sound that this album has. The songwriting is uneven, uh, too uneven, I think, to sustain interest. Uh, Be the Rain and Bandit are great numbers, I think, but its narrative is muddled and not helped in any way by the slop fest that is uh, Crazy Horse uh, as the backing band to this. Number 25 is Silver and Gold from 2000. And uh, another album in the country rock vein, uh, perhaps trying to tap into the, uh, the sort of plaintive tones and magic that was the original Harvest album. There are some good tracks on this album, but a lot of the material is subpar. It lacks that whimsical and at times uh, freshness that the original Harvest album had, instead preferring to dwell in a kind of tired nostalgia. It has a stripped down feel, uh, including harmonica, pedal steel, and backing vocals from the wonderful Emmy Lou Harris and Linda Ronstadt. It kind of gets the audience all lubed up for potentially another harvest. But unfortunately, the material is a tad sort of so so, really, and doesn't meet our expectations. Number 24 is Prairie Wind from 2004, I believe. 2005, I stand corrected. Another album very much in the Harvest vein, I think arguably one of uh, Young's stronger later albums as far as I'm concerned, although with a lot of his later material that bar is set pretty low to begin with. I like the autumnal reflective tone on this record, wonderful tracks like He Was The King and The Old Guitar, these are quite uh, affecting numbers. And I think this album is uh, somewhat inspired by Young coming to terms with the death of his father. Number 23 is A Letter Home from 2014. I know a lot of people rank this a lot lower. Um, uh, it's not an album I listen to a lot because it, it's quite hard going really, but it has a kind of a ghostly feel to it uh, that I rather enjoy in some respects. It's an all covers album, of course, songs by Dylan, Willie Nelson, of course, Bruce Springsteen, uh, as well as others. And it features mostly Young just on vocals, guitar, harmonica and piano. Recorded in a vintage 1947 recording booth in Jack White's Nashville studio. He even guests on a couple of the songs on this record. I think what is appealing about this record is that sense of intimacy. Some say claustrophobia, but I think intimacy is a better word. And it's a record that sounds, um, well, it's certainly unpolished and unfinished and uh, restrained by the sonic limitations of the way it's recorded. But nevertheless, it's intriguing, interesting and has, has something about it. It has a charm, for want of a better word. I particularly like the uh, the wonderful cover of Bert Jansch's uh, Needle of Death and the wonderful haunting version of Springsteen's My Hometown. 
22 is Living with the War from 2006. Uh, again, this is another one that ranks fairly low on uh, in these kind of young ranking videos, but I find this one quite interesting. I think sonically it's interesting because it's use of orchestra as well. It's nevertheless, it's an anti-Iraq war tirade. And I think the difference with some of his later material is he generally sounds energized on this one. It certainly caused a lot of furore. In fact, uh, the subsequent uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young concerts had a lot of his more conservative audience uh, walking out. You get songs like Let's Impeach the President, making this arguably one of uh, Young's most political of records. They've all been political records, I think, lately. And overall, there's large parts of this record that just doesn't connect. But uh, one has to be inspired by Young's energy and commitment to his message on this one. Number 21 is React from 1981. Many see this as a kind of a reaction to the, well, best of piece together, laid back tones of uh, hawks and doves. It sees Young working with Crazy Horse and it has that plugged in feel. It's a good Crazy Horse album. It's grinding, it's dark, if not a bit repetitious, but it's supposed to be repetitious that so thematically links into the grueling ordeal uh, endured by Young's son, I think. Nevertheless, this album is hard work to listen to, occasionally meandering and uninspired, occasionally magnificent. A ferocious din of songs like Surfer Joe and Mow the Sleaze, and of course the concluding shots are all numbers that are worth checking out. Number 20 is Long May You Run from 1976, the collaboration he did with Stephen Stills. This followed uh, hard upon the Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young tour of 1974. Lots of use of session musicians on this album, but nevertheless it was lots, a lot smoother. I think in terms of its sound than Young was perhaps used to at this time. Overall, the result is a listenable record, but not a compelling one. It's certainly, um, I think, well below par of what Young was actually producing at this time. Number 19 is World Record from 2022. Uh, this is his collaboration with uh, famed producer Rick Rubin. This very much like the predecessors Barn and Colorado is very much a live album. Live album in the sense that it was just performed live and recorded. And of course we get Neil Young um, exploring his passion, enthusiasm for environmental issues. Nothing new there, I hear you say. Uh, specifically, man's mistreatment of it. And like a lot of his stuff, it seems to be overtly political. This stuff I find quite jarring at times. I much prefer it when he explores the affairs of the human heart and the, the, the existential trudge of just getting through this life. That's when I think some of his writings at its very best. And I must say, Crazy Horse actually sound rather good on this one. And Neil Young, given his due, still sounds very passionate on these topics and certainly likes to drive that nail in. Number 18 is Le Noise from 2010. I sometimes feel this album is a kind of a response to many critics who felt it had gotten rather syrupy, mediocre. And this album feels like a battering ram, especially after what many would consider fairly... Uh, lo-fi, lacklustre releases. And producer Daniel Lenoyce works well with Young to construct a sonic palette of feedback. Not something that Young is actually a stranger to, I think. And amongst all that whine and distortion, you can actually detect some skeletal fragments of some actual numbers on this one. And it all comes together as a glorious hodgepodge of neonness. And of all that feedback squall isn't uh, disorientating enough, uh, Lenoyce actually adds some um, dizzying tape loops while Young chugs away on that electric guitar. Number 17 is Sleeps With Angels from 1994. Uh, death absolutely pervades this one. It hangs over it like a pall, reminding us of um, Tonight's the Night from about 10 years prior to this one, 20 years prior to this one, sorry. Uh, this album is a dark, brooding rumination on, on death, inspired by the uh, tragic suicide of Kurt Cobain, who, of course, cites Neil Young in his uh, suicide note. And we get that incessant chug or grunge, no pun intended, of Crazy Horse here, as Young plugs in and turns up and chips away at these numbers. This atmospheric doom is punctuated by the, the feedback squall and what can only be described as orchestrated noise. This is, in my opinion, one of Young's most haunting and haunted albums, with the 14 minute change your mind as the highlight. Number 16 is Harvest Moon from 1992, a quieter, a quieter, more laid back album, uh, mainly because Neil Young developed serious tinnitus after the Ragged Glory sessions. And of course the, um, the title is referencing that glorious album from 1972. He's in fact working with a lot of the same musicians as well. 
But he produces here one of his most tranquil records, filled with a sort of introspection and laid-back ease. The overall vibe and sound of this record is one of wistful nostalgia. The title track is perhaps one of the best tracks, despite having a, a riff that seems to be obviously nicked from the Everly Brothers' Walk Right Back. This album was described by Ultimate Classic Rock as a beautiful hymn to marriage and enduring love. Number 15 comes a time from 1978. This started life as a solo record until he decides to uh, bring in the horse once more, giving it a more ragged sound. Uh, a lot of critics were um, uh, suggesting this was going to be a kind of sequel or to Harvest or certainly in that vein. It seems to be a motif throughout Young's career really, us hoping he's going to tap into that again. But unlike that uh, 1972 classic, this one is really rough around the edges. Crazy Horse do well on numbers they do play on, namely Lot of Love and Look Out for My Love, and generally render this one one of Neil's better albums. And was certainly received well by the critics like Rob Criscow with The Village Voice, not so well by Rolling Stone, uh, who, say, who expressed disappointment at the relative facelessness of the songwriting when compared to the rougher music on early albums like Zuma and American Stars and Bars. Number 14 is Colorado from 2019. I have actually been enjoying some of these later releases from Neil, to be honest with you, even though he churns out a couple a year, it feels like. This is a new collaboration with Crazy Horse rather than the uh, corporate bashing promise of the real. And it is, in fact, his first album with the horse since the wonderful uh, 2012 Psychedelic Pill album. It does lack some of that freewheeling spirit we get with uh, Young and Crazy Horse, ramblings that are wrapped up in the obligatory distortion and rage. It's a kind of middling album. It, it does feature some great performances and some of it is a little bit ham-fisted, I guess. And I think this album actually um, displays some quality tunage and good writing. Number 13 is a barn from 2021, very much like its predecessor, Colorado. Uh, it was recorded quickly with Crazy Horse. But what's interesting, what makes this album interesting for me is it, it's dealing with themes of mortality and ageing, which is when Young is at its very best, when he's exploring these ideas rather than banging that political drum all the time. Ramada Inn of uh, Psychedelic Pill is one of the finest songs he's ever written. So we do get more reflective songs dealing with age and moving on in one's life, rendering it a, a more languid album than we used to, used to all that usual buzz and burr of uh, squall from the Neil Young and Crazy Horse collaborations. This album has a charm and a lot of the heaviness is dialed back. I wonder if that's the influence of Niles Lofgren on this one. Uh, I think I, th I certainly think it had a lot to do with reshaping the sound of this record. Interestingly, writing for Pop Matters, John Amon gave this project 7 out of 10, concluding their navigations of sublimity versus subtlety maximalism versus spaciousness and free improvisation versus precise compositions rendering these tracks as inexhaustible and stylistic odes number 12 is psychedelic pill from 2012 i love this album i saw him on this tour in fact and this album follows the absolutely dreadful americana lots of meandering um jams between him and uh, crazy horse with tracks that uh, go on for about 15 minutes each as i've said ramada in is one of the finest songs that he's ever written i think and could easily i would easily put it up there with uh, cortez the killer there's an album that dwells on the death of the hippie dream and uh, and how uh, uh devastating it is for us to be listening to music as, as mp3 files rather than analog files Maybe it's a plug for his new Pono uh, music player. There's no doubt that Psychedelic Pill is a long and exhausting listen, but Crazy Horse carry themselves with an equine grace, I think. It's definitely one of his better later works, and I like to drift away rather than drifting back with this one. Number 11 is American Stars and Bars from 1977. I rather enjoy this one, despite it being a bit of a scattered record, shall we say. Uh, Crazy Horse play on a few of these songs, as do Emmylou Harris and Ronstadt, and even sonically, it's a kind of a bumpy ride. I, I think it holds together well. Of course, the centerpiece is the wonderful uh, Like a Hurricane, which is absolutely sublime. This is um, not one of Neil Young's strongest 70s albums, there's no doubt about that. A lot of the tracks 
uh, were, were taken from it, the Homegrown project, which of course has uh, subsequently seen a release. Number 10 is Neil Young from 1968, the debut album. This is a scattered album, really, made up of songs that uh, Neil Young had written during uh, his time with Buffalo Springfield. In fact, during the sessions for Buffalo Springfield, again, the second record. This album was recorded on his 23rd birthday and is made up of some great songs that would often form the bedrock of his life set. We get tracks like The Loner and The Old Laughing Lady. As I've said, these are songs that were actually written during the Buffalo Springfield Again sessions. However, this record is somewhat dampened or smothered, I would say, by Jack Nietzsche's ornate arrangements. Uh, I think um, uh, leaving the, the, the actual songs themselves gasping uh, for air beneath it all. Certainly Neil Young after this favoured uh, spontaneity and simplicity over the uh, kind of this ornate colouring in the studio. Number nine is Everyone Know This Is Nowhere from 1969. This is the album, of course, that we see uh, Crazy Horse debut with Neil Young. And it's an album that kind of rights the wrongs of the, uh, the first record. Some great songs that would very much define uh, Neil Young's career on this one. Cinnamon Girl has an absolute killer riff, there's no doubt about it. And Down By The River is a wonderful song. Um, I read somewhere in, um, uh, I think, is it John Harris's book? I hope I got the name right, John Harris's book on Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, that uh, Roger Waters, being a huge Neil Young fan, actually borrowed the chord sequence for Down by the River for the song Bree. Number eight is Freedom from 1989. This is viewed as somewhat of a comeback album, considering his, uh, considering the disappointing albums he released in the 1980s. It's certainly um, one of his most focused albums, really, where he unleashes an eerie's worth of rage on this record. Freedom sees Young swinging at the socio-political landscape like his very life depended upon it and of course it does feature keep on rocking in the free world full of rage and power and was one of those albums that certainly chimed with the nascent uh, grunge scene some great tracks on here of the hornback crime in the city 60 zero as well as the ferocious feedback squall of his uh, uh, cover of on broadway number seven is rust never sleeps in 1979 a kind of live album, but not a live album. It was actually recorded in front of a, a live audience, so it is a live album, but then it was seriously overdubbed in the studio to make it not so live. Nevertheless, it was a tale of two sides of vinyl. Side one was uh, generally acoustic stuff, and side two plugged in with Crazy Horse. Ultimate Classic Rock called this a concept album about the end of the 70s. Or maybe it's just a Neil Young album, and considering what was to come in the 1980s, it's an album that needed to be treasured, I think. Some wonderful tracks on here, Hey Hey My Mind, The Black, Thrasher, and that heartbreaking saga of violence and the death of familial bonds in Powderfinger. This is definitely one of his best albums. Number six is Ragged Glory from 1990. There's no doubt that freedom certainly greased the wheels with this Neil Young resurgence, uh, and this album serves as a, a prime example of that ragged glory. The dark, heavy, feedback, yowl content is... Um, arguably laying the foundations for a whole new genre. Plugged in a nasty Neil Young and Crazy Horse rage through this uh, collection of songs. They take, where they take their amped up fury to just new levels. It's Crazy Horse at the most gleefully primitive, raging through garage rock staples like uh, the Premier's Farmer John, for example, where you get those riotous jams on here like uh, Love and Only Love Mansion on the Hill, as well as, um, as well as songs that point to, rather candidly, to his own limitations, like fucking up. Number five is On The Beach, which is one of his uh, Ditch series of albums. Of course, this came out in 1974. Despairing, disconsolate lyrics set to beautiful, beautiful music. The shimmering electric piano of See The Sky About To Rain, the epic acoustic close of Ambulance Blues, where he informs us we're all just pissing in the wind. It very much sets the tone for this one. This album feels sort of thrown together, but it really works. He's working with various different musicians as he kind of mourns, not only the death of Friends, but the death of the 60s as well. This is a gloomy album, but certainly one of his most underrated. And the title track, Stoned, Misty Take on Rock, is compelling. It's compelling listening. And for contrast, of course, there's always Revolution Blues, a ferocious, unsparing portrait of uh, uh, Charles Manson. A chap that is seen as striking the death knell for the counterculture and the hippie dream. Number four is Tonight's the Night from 1975. This is Young's tequila sodden eulogy to the the to his, the death of a friend, of course. The friend being a guitarist, Danny Witten, 
and their roadie Bruce Perry, of course, is a harrowing listen. And the drunken raucousness of the performances are particularly striking, very much fitting in with the overall theme and idea of the record. Tonight's Tonight is so bleak, apparently it was recorded in 1973, but was kind of sat upon for two years before they actually released it. It was recorded in one session, it's just an outpouring of rage and grief at the, the passing, as I've already said, of uh, Danny Witten. This is one of Rock's most harrowing and cathartic works. And talking of his legacy series, there was a, a live uh, concert from about this time released. That's definitely worth checking out as well. Number three is Harvest from 1972, Young's only number one album, full of stripped back acoustic uh, numbers, mournful lamentations uh, on and observations of the world around him. The tone and atmosphere of this album is quite striking and that's certainly aided by the eclectic nature of the material swinging from uh, country folk and Americana, um, including some pretty heavy numbers about death. The success of this album was, uh, I think Young found, this, found it rather overwhelming to be honest with you. He still includes Heart of Gold in his set whenever he plays even now. Number two is Zuma from 1975, arguably his best album. This often switches place with the, the, the one above it. And it does contain my, uh, my favorite, one of my favorite Neil Young tracks, which is Cortez the Killer. But it's a powerful album that crawls out of the, the dark sludge that is Tonight's the Night. Those ditch trilogy of albums that precede this one um, certainly make this, render this one slightly lighter in tone. There's no doubt about that. It's at times a bit anarchic and sprawling. But we do get that wonderful, majestic, historical, epic Cortez the Killer, full of historical inaccuracies, of course, but it was a vehicle for Young's politics even then. Number one is After the Gold Rush from 1970. This is Neil Young very much reflecting on the passing of the 1960s, hence its title After the Gold Rush. In fact, I think it was described as Young's Morning After the 60s album. This is an album that um, really establishes Young as a visionary songwriter and um, the feel of this record, it has an itinerant feel to it due to the fact that a lot of the musicians just step in and out of it, including Crazy Horse, including an 18-year-old Nars Lofgren. This is one of the most important albums of the 1970s, in my opinion, uh, released more or less the same time as Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Water. However, unlike Bridge Over Troubled Water, which has a consoling feel to it. This is uh, troubling and affected and gaunt and he takes the listener on a um, not only uh, a kind of appraisal of the decade that has passed but perhaps expresses his hopes for one that is to come. We get a lot of themes that he would explore in his later uh, works of course racism and ecological disaster and also sports are wonderful don't let it bring you down which Young has noted uh, I think in his autobiography that it's guaranteed to bring you down. There you are, there's my ranking of Neil Young Studio albums. If you enjoyed this, please share it. Uh, and other than that, I'll leave you with my closing salvo, which is I hope you're well, staying safe, but more importantly, that you keep listening.